and here we are in the last month of wet and I'm pretty tired from the scouting that I did so I am going to take a stroll in the garden but first I'll talk to Cal. Cal claps you on the back. Solana, good to see you. Have you come to see the new genetically modified hybrids? Tanks on some real future tech with these ones. Apparently they're gonna yield like four times as much fruit. And their vine is going to be edible too. Oh, cool. And we can take a walk in the garden. You can show me. You and Cal go for a walk through the gardens, arm in arm. Cal is an endless font of knowledge about the various plants and fungi that grow here and how the specimens brought from Earth have changed since you arrived. You meander to the gazebo where you sit for a while and enjoy the fresh air. Cal's hand is warm and calloused in yours. He runs his thumb over your knuckles and gazes at you with love. This is my favorite place in the colony, he says and kisses the back of your hand. And you're my favorite person. You're my favorite person too. And uh, mush wood. But also, now that I'm not feeling s so stressed, I'll go help with the kids some more. You tutor anemones for younger siblings, Cumulus, Sirius, Stratus, and young Nimbus. The triplets are absolutely uncontrollable. But Nimbus actually seems to be trying. It must be hard being the runt of the litter when all your siblings are so physical. At times, he tries to answer a question, one of the other three shouts over him. You try to give him extra attention so that he feels comfortable. Maybe one of Aunt Anne's kids will turn out to be a brainiac. It's glow season. Um, at least we can try to see if we can find any collectibles. Okay, so there's these. There's a crystal cluster. I don't see anything back there. And Cal's over here. You okay? Cal is standing at the edge of the garden looking at the newly reconstructed wall. Everyone says that the soldiers are going to protect us this time, he says thoughtfully. But I can't help but think it's only going to make the aliens more mad. Like, maybe it'll be okay this time, but what about next year or the year after that? He rubs his chin with the back of his hand. This is their planet, he continues. If we, can, if we can't figure out how to play nice, they're not going to stop until we're gone. Yeah. Maybe something I can do is to help teach the kids to appreciate the planet and the animals that are already here. Turning is great because it exposes all the gaps into your own knowledge. One of the kids asks you how the first humans made tools if they didn't have any tools, and you can almost feel it re reboot your brain when you try to answer. Then, before you can say anything, another kid asks why there are infinite numbers but not infinite words. Then another asks if thought weighs anything if, it, if smart people have heavier brains. You eventually just have to distract them so they'll talk about probability and statistics again. So I have to use that one. Well, it's 42. And I got a super goal. Wow. Yep. You're heading to bed when the sirens begin to wail, heralding the beginning of the yearly Xenofauna attack. Outside your window, you see the soldiers begin to form up. This year, Anemone is heading up her own squad. You see her red hair bobbing along with the others as she rushes to defend the walls. 
you close your windows and pull the covers over your head, then get a hollow call notifica notification from Mars. You join to find Mars, Tangent, Cal, Rex, and Nomi already in the call. I can see everything from my bedroom window, Mars says. Nemi's got her own squad and everything now. Look at her go! Cal makes a noise of discomfort, but doesn't voice his opinion. Suddenly, your room sh is rocked by an immensely loud shockwave, then the wall of heat you can feel even through your closed windows. Keepsakes rattle around on your shelves, some falling to the floor and shattering. Your hollow chat explodes with alarmed clatter. What was that? Is everyone okay? There was an explosion, Mar Mars exclaims. I can see it. Part of the wall is missing. There's monsters pouring in. Everyone starts talking in a panic. Tang's cool voice cuts in. The explosion came from inside, she says. Congruence made a trajectory and damage calculations. The walls blew outward, and there's fire damage in the garrison walls. She quiets a few seconds, then. Deese, are you in the call? Are you safe? There is no answer. You don't think he was caught outside, was he? Mars asks. But no one has an answer. Knowing Deese? He might have been, or he could have slipped away to somewhere. You and your friends keep the call open and speculate on what's happening outside, supplemented by Mars's observations and Tangent's reading of Congruence's processes. Everyone is on the call except Base and Anemone, who are defending the colony, and Deese, of course. You can't shake the dark feeling you get when you think about him. If someone had sent a bomb inside the colony near the garrison, you only know one person who could have done it. In the quiet following the battle, the colony comes out of hiding together in the courtyard surveying the damage. Governor Loom is on a warpath. I'll find out who did it and I'll have their head, he yells. I want every single straddle lined up in questions. Those were our explosives. I want to know who set that bomb. You and everyone from the strato are hauled aside in questions on your whereabouts prior to the attack. Everyone that is except Dees. He's nowhere to be found, dead or alive. Dees? Well, now we're 19. I guess we'll see what this year has to offer. And hopefully we can find D somewhere. Also, I didn't see anything about Cal there, so does that mean I have 100? I have 100 friendship with Cal. Wow. Okay. Cool. And I'm also feeling pretty stressed again, which means I'm probably definitely gonna need to Take a rest in the garden. Oh, Nomi has something to say. I'll go talk to her in a minute once I've looked around for any possible collectibles. Hey, Nomi. You're walking through the colony when you see a blur of color and motion in the corner of your vision. Bang! Komi collides with you in a, ca in a catastrophe of flailing limbs and high-pitched squealing sending you both sprawling to the ground. Oh my gosh! Nomi exclaims. They immediately get to their hands and knees begin to collect the papers that exploded out of their hands when they fell. I'm so 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 sorry. Sometimes my brain is off doing its own thing and I don't watch where I'm running. Ah! They exclaim, dusting off the piece of toast and shoving it back in their mouth. Gotta gotta eat breakfast even when you're late! Uh, don't worry about it. Nomi giggles and continues to collect their scattered papers, their face bright red. Okay, if you say so, thanks, Solana. Um, maybe if I had a genetic enhancement like everyone else, I would be able to watch where I'm going. Oh, you don't have one. That's interesting. Nomi gets to their feet and offers you a hand up, then brushes the dust off you. Actually, I don't know what my genetic enhancement is, or even if I have one at all. My parents decided to lock my medical files when I was a baby because they had this wild idea that they wanted me to grow up without feeling like I had to be, um, perfect. They think it's rude for parents to make choices for their kids. Huh. That's interesting. 
"Yeah, I think so too," Nomi replies, smiling brightly. "Sometimes I think about what kind of cool superpower I wish I had, but most of the time I just assume my parents avoided telling me they gave me the superpower of being turbo awesome." Nomi wiggles their eyebrows. "Maybe I'm just like a galactic cyber prince Umiyama, and the and one day a talking Hopeye will come tell me I have to beat the Mecha Ultra Nether Beings." Nomi starts walking with you, talking animatedly with their hands. I know my parents just wanted me to know that I can be anything when I grow up, and I don't have to be super strong or super smart in order to be happy. They always told me, nothing and nobody knows what's good for Nomi except Nomi. And I really think that's true. Some, they stop and turn to you, looking serious for a moment. Sometimes it does feel like, well... Nomi squints up at the sky. Sometimes I wonder if I'm only good at something because I have some kind of secret advantage I don't know about. Or sometimes I think the opposite. Like, if I'm not very good at something, I feel angry because maybe I could have been good at it. It was really bad on Helio because everyone is really good at something. Usually things like marching and shooting stuff. I thought maybe it would be feel different here where people with all kinds of skills, but... They say, no matter what I try, someone is already way better at it. So I feel like I just suck at everything. Everyone's not that great at things at first. It's the first step to being kind of good at something, Nomi says brightly. That's from a show I used to watch, and I guess I don't suck at everything. They strike a pose with their imaginary laser pistol. I'm really good at laser fable. Pew pew! I know, I need a break. But let's check outside to see if there's anything out here. Nope. I'm not seeing anything. Also, no Dece. It's a little concerning. Cal is diligently logging the season's crops into the colony's agricultural inventory, a found creasing his usual serene face. When he sees you, he smiles with relief. Solana, he says, reaching out and taking your hand. He pulls you into an achingly tender kiss. Seeing you always makes me feel better, he says, pressing his forehead to yours. Seeing you makes me feel better, too. Some vertumen bugs have moved into the garden. They're attracted to the smell of human sweat, apparently. People were worried at first, thinking that they were dangerous, but it turns out they don't bite. They just scrape off the layer of dead skin. Now people are just vaguely grossed out, which is a lot better. Sometimes you see Mars out here reading a, a hollow magazine and letting the bugs crawl all over her feet. She says it's like a spa treatment. Well, I mean, I guess on Earth people would do that with fish. The investigation into the bombing during the glow attack continues all month. Governor Loom and his goons can't find a way to pin it on any of the stratos, and over time, people come to accept that Dee's was probably the culprit. The rumor doesn't make anyone feel better, but it does take the heat off the others, including yourself. As usual, for this time of year, your dreams have been more vibrant and invasive. You have trouble distinguishing dream from reality during the day. You dread falling asleep at night. How did that hop I get here? You chase it out your balcony floor and you find yourself in a thickly wooded bath of mushwood pressing in close on every side. The light here is weird, pink and glittering casting teal shadows. The hop I disappears down a hole in the ground and without thinking you dive in, squeezing your shoulders to fit through. Alice in Wonderland everyone? Anyone? You stumble into a cave, beautiful and surreal, shimmering with a light that seems to come from within. When you take a step forward, granules of pink sand crunch underfoot. The cave opens into a forest that seems lifted from a fairy tale. The, s the sunlight beams through breaks in the trees, illuminating path of mushroom-ringed stepping stones that lead you to a small cottage. You see the hop eye hurrying further down the path. Maybe we can try to go into the cottage? Oh, it looks like the farm. The room that we used to keep socks in. Dees is here. It's his home, you think. He's hunched over a woodworking bench, and it 
and looks up at you as if you've called his name. You realize with a, and when you realize with alarm that he's working on himself, as if he's part tree. He waves at you with a hand at ends of small blossoming branches as unsettled. You hurry onwards through the door at the rear of the cabin. Too late, you realize the door opens into empty air and you tumble. You land on hard, solid ground, you breathe your breath whooshing from you. It's hot here, impossibly hot. The twin suns beat down on you, burning your skin on contact, and the air is almost painful to breathe. In all directions stretches the barren wasteland of dead trees, like bones puncturing the dry skin of the planet. Is that what's going to happen as Bloom has his way? You rise from the dusty, cracked earth beginning, and begin to walk, stumbling over the bones of unknown creatures. You don't know where you're walking, only that the horizon doesn't change. The red sky just stretches overhead like a great bowl of heat pressing down on you. Whoa. A great roar shakes you, and you turn to see a chimeric nightmare, a manticore, but with Governor Loom's face? So that's what a manticore looks like. He towers over you from a podium, claws clacking and tail thrashing as he proselytizes. We, primeval vil forest felling, he chants. We, the rivers stemming, piercing deep the mines within, the surface board surveying, we, the virgin soil upheaving. Overhead, the sky streaked with smoke. You hear rumbling in the distance. You plant your legs and refuse to look away from the beast. With a yell from behind you, Mars appears and swings a sword made of light at the loom abomination. Its head rolls across the dirt, but it continues to speak. You turn from the scene and walk away, feeling the memory of it cling to you as you push and claw your way through, another, through to another reality. You stumble forward into the dark glowing forest. Blessedly cool air brushes your cheeks, thick with moisture, and making your face wet as if you'd been crying. The path winds upwards, flanked by humanoid figures carrying candles. Some are wearing robes, some armor, some lad copes, and some in bio suits and formal wear. Some are elderly, and some barely ten years old. All turn to look at you, and you realize with a jolt, they're you. Every single one of them is you. You see yourself reflected in their eyes as they gaze upon you dispassionately, a line of possibility stretching out as far as you can see. The hop eye crouches between the ranks and gazes sullenly out as you pass. You walk steadily upward, feeling their unflinching gaze follow you. Overhead, the wormhole hangs in the sky like an overripe fruit bending the heavy branch of space and time towards you. It's so close, you feel as if you could touch it. You stretch your hand out, seeking. You wake up. Milky, quiet sunlight pours through your windows, flakes of bromide snow piling up against the glass. You feel as tired as when you went to bed. It's your birthday. You're 19 years old. Only one more year as a teenager. I guess we'll have to see what to make of that next time.